My name is Pastor How you are? We'd like to welcome you to our morning service at Hastings Park Bible Church. It's March the 13th. We're glad you could join us and trust you'll be blessed as you worship together with us. Just a couple of announcements to remind you of. It's Wednesday is 7 o'clock prayer meeting, and we encourage you to come out. We're looking at the book of Psalms and to just come together to pray. Pray for our church, pray for the world and the things that are going on around us. We can never overemphasize the importance of prayer, even cor- especially corporate prayer. And I think we need to be reminded of that. It just sort of just calms our hearts, brings us to, together, and, and just reminds us of who is in control, that God reigns, and that we are looking for him to soon return. Maybe in our lifetime, maybe not, we don't know, but we are serving a coming king. And we need to, be, to pray and ask God's will might be done on earth as it is in heaven, and we know it will be. But it's just good to be gathered together. So we encourage you to come out and study God's word with us and pray together. And then Awana meets as well. If you want to drop your kids off and join us in prayer meeting, we'd love to have you do that. But Awan is at 645, and the kids have a great time there as well. And then Thursday, Bible studies, the ladies' Bible study, 7 or 1030 in the morning and 7 o'clock at night, and then the men meet at 7 o'clock at night for Bible study as well. I'd just like to read a passage of Scripture to begin, then we'll have a word of prayer and Scripture reading and then look into the Word of God together. Isaiah chapter 42, thus says God the Lord, who created heavens, the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and his offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord and I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you and I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations to open blind eyes, to bring up prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. I am the Lord, that is my name, and I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Let's just look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege of being able to have your word, study your word, and we just pray, Lord, as we Open it together that you might just open our eyes that we might see wonderful things from your word. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are the Lord of heaven, the Lord of earth, the Lord who spoke this world into existence. You're the world who's coming back in judgment. We thank you, the Lord, that you came 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ, God, Emmanuel, God with us came, but he came not to judge, but he came that the world through him might be saved. He came to rescue to die for sinners, to hang upon the cross and take our sin upon himself. And you laid on him the iniquity of us all. And he was buried and rose again the third day, and one day he's coming back. And we're looking for the soon return of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who will take us home to be with himself. We long for that day. But we also pray that we sense the urgency, Lord, of spreading the good news of Christ, because next time you come, you're coming in judgment. You're going to come to judge this world. And for their sin, for their rebellion against you, and there's only one hope, and that's Christ alone. So we thank you for your work in us. We thank you for the salvation that you've provided for us in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, for your long suffering. And we pray, Lord, that you would just be with us this morning as we worship you. May we do so in spirit and in truth. And may your words touch our hearts, convict and challenge and strengthen as we look at this very important subject together. So we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for your grace and goodness. And we just thank you for who you are. And we just thank you for all you've done and are doing in our lives on a daily basis. We ask these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Ephesians 4, 17 to 32. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind. Being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. 
and put on the new self which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. May God bless the reading of his word. That's a wonderful passage that we just read in Ephesians chapter 4, a very important passage, and we're going to be looking at not that passage in particular this morning, but certainly one that parallels that, and there, there are many. We began looking last week in 1 Thessalonians. We've been going through 1 Thessalonians, and in chapter 4, we begin looking at verses 1 through 3, where he says, This is the will of God for you, your sanctification, and that we abstain from sexual immorality. And we began looking at the fact that, that God is working in us, the Christian life, begins at salvation, it ends at glorification, when we see him face to face, when we die, when we will become like him, we'll get new bodies, we'll be glorified, and those things take place in an instant. The moment we believe in Jesus Christ, we're saved, the moment we go into his presence, we become like him, for we'll see him as he is, but all that in the middle, the Christian life, is what we're talking about now, the sanctification, what God is doing in us right now. He doesn't just save us and glorify us. He's working in every believer to conform us into the image of Christ. This is the will of God, your sanctification, your Christ-likeness, that we become like Christ, that we become like what God God is working out, what he's worked in, as we'll see in a moment. And that's what these verses are talking about in Ephesians. And the verses we're going to be looking at this morning in Galatians chapter 5. So I'd like to read these verses to begin Verses 16 to 23 of Galatians, and then we'll jump in and look at verse 16 together. For you are called to freedom, brother, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions. Envying, drunkenness, carousing, and the things like of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Again, words that very much parallel what we read in Ephesians chapter 4. And we want to look at these verses this morning for a few moments. But let's just ask God's blessing upon us as we begin. Father, we thank you for your word that it speaks to us with power, with authority, with truth, absolute truth, unchangeable truth, sanctifying truth. We thank you that your word is powerful, is sharper than a two-edged sword, and we pray this morning as we go through this text that you will just, through your word, do what your word does. It gets down into the thoughts and the intents of the heart, that we might search our hearts, we might ask ourselves some important questions as we think about this subject of 
growing in godliness, growing in Christ-likeness, sanctification. We pray, Lord, that you would just work mightily in our hearts, mightily in us, and that we will be encouraged, that we will be challenged, and that you would just draw us to yourself and help us to realize what you're doing in us and through in us every day of our life as we walk with you day in and day out. And so, Lord, bless us this morning, we pray, into your word. Open our eyes that we might see wonderful things from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're living in a world that is predisposed to take the path of least resistance. This temporary, or this attitude produces this longing for or looking for temporary pleasures, which are certainly easy, the least resistance. And temporary pleasures override eternal realities in many people's lives, most people's lives. But Christians has even especially fallen prey to this in the spirit of our times, the spirit of the age, if you will, that we're pers- we far more concerned with pleasure than we are eternity. Temporary pleasures versus eternal foundational truth, eternal realities. If you've ever watched infomercials, whether they're selling inf- exercise equipment or a diet plan or whatever it is. There's three words as you always hear. It has to be quick. It has to be fun. And it has to be easy. If I'm going to exercise, it's going to be fun, easy, and quick. If I want to lose weight, it's going to be fun, easy, and quick. If I want to exercise, all these things, whatever it is, those three things have to be part. If it's not easy, if it's not fun, if it's not quick, I don't want, I can't be bothered with it. The sad thing is, that's how we want our Christian life. That's how we want church to work. That's how we want worship to work. That's how we want spiritual growth to work. It's got to be easy, fun, and quick. And consequently, we live our life by Christian cliches more so than we do rather biblical conviction and biblical truth. Don't worry, be happy. It's a jingle that seems to be replaced, prepare to meet your God. We want relevance in our life, not reverence. We want no heavy commitments. We want no strings attached. We want no muss, no fuss. I remember somebody asking me one time years ago, what can I do, how can I serve the Lord without being committed? What can I do in the Christian life? I want to be involved, but I just don't want to be committed. What can I do? And the short answer is, and the long answer is this, nothing. Commitment is part of serving, is part of the Christian life. And that's how many people think today. We don't want commitments. We want no strings attached, no muss, no fuss. And you translate this into a practical lifestyle, and it results in a life that's not lived carefully, diligently, or faithfully, but carelessly, unwisely, without understanding or faithfulness. And they become like a tumbleweed just blowing in the wind. Whatever way the wind is blowing, whatever whim they wake up with in the morning, will we go to church? Well, I don't really feel like it, so let's stay home. And that's how church becomes, that's what our Christian life becomes. It's just blowing, whatever, going whatever way the wind blows, whatever emotional thing they may have. They don't have any power to overcome the emotion, feelings, they're driven by all those things. And they just become a life that's lived all over the map. One minute they're hot, the next minute they're cold. One minute they say they want to be committed, and they come for a week and you never see them again. That's That's the culture that we're living in. But that's not the Christian life. So the verses before us this morning are critical to understanding the Christian life. How do we live godly lives? How do we live Christ glorifying lives? What is God doing in us right now in our today as we're living? What is God's desire for us as Christians when we get up in the morning, when we go to work, in our family, in our marriage, in our church? We have an enemy, as we know, Satan. And he always, Satan always attacks the areas in our lives that he knows are of utmost importance. He does it in our culture as well. One of the foundational realities 
and foundations of any culture is family. As the family goes, so goes the nation, so goes the church, so goes the culture. And right now, Satan is tearing, the, ripping the family apart, as we know. Marriages, morality. Satan is going in and taking and just destroying the family, and, and we see the results everywhere in our society. But he doesn't just stop in the world. Satan loves to come to church, and he loves to destroy the most fundamental things that are important in the church, the gospel, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to go to church, be involved in a church, prayer, scripture, the deity of Christ, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, serving others, marriage, family. He loves to come in and destroy these foundational truths in life because he knows they're important. He knows how important they truly are. But it's in these very areas that the gospel has a radical, profound impact on us as well. We call it transformation. The gospel is sufficient to transform, to transform a life, to transform a marriage, a family, a church, a town, a nation, the world. The gospel is sufficient, powerful. God's grace is sufficient. God's word is sufficient to transform us, to bring us out of a horrible pit to set our feet upon a rock and to put a new song in our mouth. When God begins that work of transformation in our life through the gospel of Jesus Christ, it changes our lives, therefore it changes our marriage, it changes our family. And this is what, that's what Paul's writing about in Ephesians. It's what he's writing about in Romans chapter 8, chapter 6. It's what he, Paul's writing about in Galatians chapter 5. It's called sanctification. Becoming holy, pure, pursuing holiness in the fear of God, Christ likeness. So let's look at these verses. There's lots could be said. We've done a series on the Holy Spirit in the past. So there's lots that we could do. I think we spent 15 weeks looking at the ministry, the, the person of the Holy Spirit. So we're not going to say everything that we could say or probably should say, but we want to just work our way through these verses in the next few weeks to understand them. Because they're very important verses if we want to understand what Paul's saying in 1 Thessalonians 4. This is the will of God. The will of God. What's the will of God for me? My sanctification. That I grow in Christ's likeness. So how do we do that? Well, he says in verse 15, he's contrasting something. If you bite and devour one another, let, take care that you are not consumed by one another. So in contrast, he says we need to love one another. Well, how do we do that? How do we love one another? We shall love our neighbor as ourselves, verse 14. Well, how do we do that? Well, the first word we're confronted with is this. That I say, Paul says, Scripture says, God says, with authority, that we're to walk. The Christian life is a walk. And that word walk indicates a habitual lifestyle, continuous action. It's not a complicated word. It's a word the Bible uses very often. Paul used one of his favorite words to describe the Christian life. It's a walk. It denotes the whole context or activities of our life. It's an important word. It doesn't say run. It doesn't say sprint. It says walk. What does that mean? What does that imply? Well, it implies, number one, that a, there's a simplicity. A simplicity. Walking. It's not complicated. A child can walk. A child, when a child, young person comes to know Jesus Christ, they, can, they grow. They grow in their Christian life. It's a walk. It's a progression. It's movement. We're walking towards something. We're walking from away from something. We're walking towards Christ like it's we're walking away from worldliness. We're slowly now some walk faster than others, but we're all moving towards the same thing, Christ likeness. 
I think walk reminds us about relationships. It's hard to talk to someone when you're running together. You're trying, all you're thinking about is getting your breath and watching your step. Walking reminds us of where to focus, gives us time to focus on other people, to listen to other people as we're walking, to look around, to talk and to listen, to encourage. Much of Jesus' teaching he did with his disciples was he was walking with them. And it's very important for us to understand because the Bible clearly teaches that we are people who, are, who have been made or created for community. God doesn't say we need to be loving one another, be with one another, it's good to be together because of sin. That wasn't sin that created this dynamic. That we were created in the image of God and God is his trinity and God has perfect fellowship within the trinity and he created us in our, his image that we were designed to live in a community, a worshipful community with God and humble community with people. We were never created to live life all by ourselves. To, under, to live in community with others is to understand the need to walk. Where others are seeking to grow and change and move forward. We, we walk together. We don't get run over. We don't leave people behind. We don't run ahead with a few buddies. We walk with. We walk together. The word walk is how we live our life, the habitual life that God has called us to live. Walk worthy, he says in Ephesians 4.1. What we have in these verses, in these chapters before us, is a call to change. It's a call to chance for transformation. It's not just change for the sake of change. When Christ saved us, we placed our faith in Jesus Christ alone. By, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And when he saved us, he saved us, and he began to change us. But positionally, we were imputed with the perfect righteousness of Christ. We stand before God now, perfect in his sight, clothed in the righteousness of Christ that was imputed to us. Our sin was imputed to him on the cross. He died for us. He bore the penalty for our sin. And he imputed unto us his perfect righteousness. Now positionally before God, we stand before him perfect. And he says, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He declares us just because we're clothed in his perfect righteousness. We become a new creation. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, as we know. And Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 tells us that. We're saved not by good works. Our works play no part in our salvation. We're saved by the works of Christ. But we're saved unto good works, not, as, not lest anyone should boast. Faith without works is dead. As we said last week, everyone God saves, he begins that moment they're saved to sanctify. Works are the evidence of salvation, not the cause. And we place our faith in Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior. God begins a work in us that he, will not, that he will complete when we see him face to face. He who began a good work in us will complete it, Philippians 1.6. God works in every believer to transform us, to change us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And that's a lasting change. It's a radical change. It's a progressive change. It is a personal change. It is a practical change. It is an inward change, producing a visible change in behavior and attitude. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. But it's not up to us to decide what, change, what that change will look like what that change will be. We already have the description. We have, a, we have the person we're to emulate set forth for us in the four Gospels. We're to be like Christ. He's transforming us into Christ's likeness, not just something different than we used to be. We do not get to define our own righteousness, one that doesn't conflict with my comfort zones or with my personality and desires and my dreams. And I hope we would all agree that for any one of us to grow, to become more like Christ, is a radical change. 
We're not almost there. We have a long way to go. Then we will never get there this side of heaven. But he begins the process of conforming us into the image of Christ the moment we place our faith in him. And this walk, this worthy walk is a life that is empowered through the Holy Spirit living in us. If you've ever gone across the ocean or met people from other churches or believers around the world, they may speak a different language, wear different clothes, have different customs and traditions in their nation and countries and so on. But when you meet a true believer, whether it's in India or Africa or Europe or south of the border, the moment you meet them, you begin to talk to them and listen to them and spend time with them, you begin to see that, you know what? You see, you see Christ in them. Just like you see Christ in people around us. You see Christ in us. They see Christ in us, hopefully. There's, a, there's something that's, that's the same, and it's Christ. He's not, we're not all becoming different people. We're becoming like Christ. And you see that wherever you go. So how does God do this? If you've ever watched YouTube and you like airplanes, they have a, several channels on YouTube committed to airplanes. And, every, and when you subscribe to them, sometimes they have videos showing the cockpit of when they're landing the plane or ta- the plane taking off. And I was watching one the other day, and, it, and the pilot was behind in the cockpit, and he was on the runway just getting ready to take off, and he pulls the throttles back, and and you begin to hear the speedometer going up and calling out the, the speed of the plane. And pretty soon he reaches takeoff speed and he pulls the yoke back and the nose lifts and the plane takes off. And, and then he retracts the landing gear and he pulls up and turns a couple of knobs here and a couple of knobs there, pushes a few buttons. Then he takes his hand off the yoke, sets the autopilot, and away she goes. Now, we know, now, the pilot could fly the whole plane anywhere he wants to go without autopilot. They know how to fly the plane. But planes have something called autopilot, so the computers fly the plane. And I think some people think that's what the Christian life is like, Christian growth is like. Just let go and let God. We get the plane off the ground and God does the rest. And that's let go and let God is a cliche, and it's one of the cliches some people live by, but it's a cliche you need to get rid of. If it's on your wall, take it off, because that's not how Christian growth works. God does not do all the work for us. He does all the work in salvation. We are saved by God alone. Christ saves us. Christ alone. But in the work of sanctification, it works like this. Philippians 2, 12-13. So then, my beloved, just as you have also obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works out you both to will and to do and to work for his good pleasure. We're to work out what God is working in. And applied in the Scripture, in the New Testament and Old Testament, is that genuine believers have a desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. They desire to live a holy life. That is the heartbeat of the Christian. That's the transformation, the change, the new creation that God makes makes in us when we become a Christian. Our desires have changed. We delight in the inward man to obey in Christ and follow Christ and pursue holiness. And as we begin this, I would encourage you, if you have no such desire, you will find these verses irrelevant and if you find these verses irrelevant you may in fact not even be a believer and you need to examine your heart examine your life if you're looking at this like you looked at algebra in high school what's the question everybody asks about algebra and calculus when are we ever going to use this and if you're listening to these verses this morning on Christ likeness and pursuing godliness and the fear of the Lord and sanctification and growing in godliness and desiring to obey him and follow him. And that's the desire of your heart. If you're listening to all that and saying, that's, when am I ever going to use this? 
When am I ever going to use this? I have no desire whatsoever for any of this stuff. Well, and you very may well, very may well be not saved. You may not be a Christian. As a matter of fact, I would go so far as to say you probably aren't. Because though everyone whom Christ saves, he begins to work. Everyone in Christ is a new creation. All things passed away, behold, all things have become new. We have a new heart. We have a new passion. Desire to be holy, Christ-like, and obey him and follow him. How do we do that? Even as a Christian, we cannot do that in our own strength. We need power, supernatural power, the power of the one we are seeking to be like. And so Paul in Galatians 5 brings us face to face with the work of the Holy Spirit. We are to walk, walk in the Spirit. And in that little phrase, he's referring to the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity who comes to live within us the moment we are saved. And when he does, we have the power to change. We have the power to change. What are the evidence of walking in the Spirit, that we're doing that? Well, Scripture doesn't leave us in the dark. We want to know what a Spirit-filled life looks like. Look, study the life of Christ. If you want to know what a Spirit-filled life looks like, Read verses 22 to 23 of Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, and so on. As we said last week, I want us to remember something. These are now verses. These are verses for today. Verses for whatever you're going through, wherever you are today. These are foundational verses for the Christian life. We all have... A desire to live the life God called us to live. But we also have something else. First Peter, Second Peter 1, 3 says, His divine power is granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We have everything that we need to grow in our Christian life. Everything we need to be victorious in our Christian life. The Christian life is not running after something more. Something else. Something different. When you got saved, you were given everything you need to grow as a Christian. Everything. What Peter tells us in these verses we just read is that if I'm struggling, if I'm weak, if I'm not growing as I should, the answer is not out there somewhere. The answer is to get on my knees and pray and to realize that I have it, all I need to do what God wants me to do today, right now. Therefore, it's an impossible to overemphasize the importance of understanding the person and work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Satan is always attacking those things that are most relevant and most important. And the Holy Spirit is one of those truths walking in the Spirit. It's one of those truths that Satan loves to get in and just mess with confuse people about. If you were asked people today in the church, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit or to walk in the Spirit? Most people are clueless. They're just totally confused about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, brings us to a very important truth. Paul says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. That's a command, to be filled with the Spirit. How do we understand what the will of the Lord is? In verse 17, be filled with the Spirit. How do we be careful not to walk as unwise men, but as wise? How do we do that? Be filled with the Spirit. How do we make the most out of our time? How do we redeem our time? Verse 16, be filled with the Spirit. How do we love our wives as Christ loved the church? Be filled with the Spirit. How do we submit our husbands as unto the Lord? Be filled with the Spirit. How do we obey our parents? Be filled with the Spirit. How do we raise up our children? Be filled with the Spirit. All of those things are in chapter 5 and 6 of Ephesians. 
But what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Let me give you a couple things quickly that it doesn't mean. Being filled with the Spirit is not a dramatic, isolated experience of suddenly being energized and spiritualized into a permanent state of advanced spirituality by a second blessing subsequent to salvation. It's not something we chase after. Being filled with the Spirit is not something that happens to you in some second experience where the Spirit of God comes, you receive the Holy Spirit after you're saved. Being filled is not the same as possessing or indwelled by the Spirit because the Spirit of God indwells every believer the moment we're saved. Romans 8 9 says, You were not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. The filling of the Spirit is not the same as being sealed or secured by the Spirit. Every believer possesses the Spirit of God, received its salvation, made alive by the Spirit, and dwelt by the Spirit. Every believer has the Spirit of God. There are not two kinds of believers. If there were, Paul would have had to make that distinction. He would have said, if you have the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. He doesn't say that. But he would have to make that distinction if not everybody had the Spirit. But every believer, the moment we're saved, receives the gift of the Holy Spirit. He seals and we are secured by him, empowered by him to walk. And he comes to take up residence in every believer's life, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is living in you if you know him. Nowhere in Scripture are we commanded or exhorted to be indwelt, baptized, or sealed by the Holy Spirit. The only command in Scripture concerning the Spirit of God is to be filled by the Spirit. And to help us understand what this looks like or means, to see, there's one key word. He gives us a picture. Do not be drunk with wine. Well, I think we all can, can picture that in our minds, what, what a drunk person looks like. But he's not telling us, that a spirit-filled person looks like a drunk person. As a matter of fact, you can't get more contrasting images than someone who's totally out of control than a spirit-filled believer who's totally in control. And that's the word that he's the, the, th- the word that he's drawing our attention to. The key word is control that he's trying to help us to see. Wine controls you. When you get drunk with wine. The wine that you've consumed is what is now controlling your life. It affects how you walk. It affects how you talk. It affects how you think. It affects how you speak and what you say. It affects your vision. Wine totally controls, really, every aspect of your life when you get drunk with it. And that's the, the, the word, he's, the analogy he's thinking here. That is in control aspect. It's the same thing that happens when you're filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Be controlled by the Spirit. And when he does, it affects our walk, our talk, our thoughts, every aspect of our life. To be controlled by a Holy Spirit or some, is not some impersonal power or drug. It's not like sticking your finger into a light socket. To be controlled is to be controlled by a person, the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity. It's personal, it's relational. He knows our weaknesses, he knows us better than we know ourselves. To be filled with the Spirit is to be under his total dominion and control. To be filled with the Spirit is not laying on the ground barking like a dog. To be filled with the Spirit is not running around buildings. To be filled with the Spirit is not acting out of control, shaking. To be filled with the Spirit is to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. To be disciplined. And when we say we want that, we need to think about that for a minute. How many people really want someone else controlling their life, their decisions? Your desires. How many people really want to give up the remote control 
in their home for the night. Give them your schedule, your dreams. To, to be filled, trans, literally, trans, is translated literally means to be, keep being, to be kept being filled. It's a continuous thing that we need to keep asking the Spirit of God to do, to fill us, to keep being filled. It's a command that includes the idea of continuous continuation. To be filled with the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, is to have the person of the Holy Spirit controlling and empowering, empowering your life. There's no more practical, necessary command in Scripture than for us to be filled in the Spirit. If we're going to walk in the Spirit, we need to be filled by the Spirit. We need His power. If we think the Christian life is easy, we don't know what the Christian life is. It's not easy. It's not hard. It's impossible. It's impossible to live the Christian life apart from Christ, the Spirit of God, living it through us. Paul says in Colossians 1.29, For this purpose I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Do you see the, contra- do you see the two things working together? Work out your own salvation, but it's God who's working in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Here we see both of those things for us. I, Paul, don't just sit back and let God, God do it. He says, I labor, striving, but according to his power, which mightily works within me. There's a great verse to memorize. We strive, we study. We labor, we struggle, we battle according to his power, which mightily works in me. Ephesians 5.20, down to him who was able to do far more abundantly above all we could ask or think, according to the power that works in us. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1.7, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Acts 4.31, when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak the word of God with boldness. With boldness. You know, you hear a lot of times, you know, people say, we want, we want to go back and be like the early church. And they start looking for programs and techniques and the secret. We want to be like the early church that turned the world upside down, the apostles. But we cannot have the early church's spiritual power simply by trying to mimic its methods of operation. It was not the techniques, and the, it was not some secret formula that they used to turn the world upside down. But it was their spirit-filled lives that proclaimed the truth, spoke the truth of the Word of God, and lived holy lives in their witness. They spoke with boldness, who were not afraid of men, but were, lived a life in fear, the fear of the Lord. And they went out under the Spirit's control, empowered, and lived lives that showed nothing else can explain this except Christ. And God blessed their lives, blessed their, his word as it went forth from their spirit-filled lips. But today we think it's all about programs and techniques, and there's nothing wrong with programs, nothing wrong with PowerPoint, there's nothing wrong with technology. But only the Spirit of God can produce godliness, Christ-likeness can transform a marriage, can make the church what God wants it to be, the Spirit of God. Well, how are we filled? How are we filled? To be filled is simply to say, Lord, I believe you're in me. Lord, I believe your Spirit lives within me. Empower me and live through me that I might do in your strength what I can never do on my own. It's to take up our cross, deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. You say, Lord, my, I, whatever I do, let it be done for your glory. Lord, I want to seek first your kingdom. 
And we say those things, it's sort of like putting up a sail on a sailboat, and he begins to fill that sail with his power and move that sailboat in that direction because you're lined up with the purposes of God for your life. Godliness, and holiness, and Christ-likeness, doing what you do for the glory of God. You see, when we, and with the Spirit, we say, fill me, he begins to fill that sail, fill our lives with his power. That we might do whatever we do to the glory of God. Paul says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. He wanted to be glorified in Christ, to be glorified in his life, whether by life or by death. And you love your wife as Christ loved the church. You forgive others, you forgive, serve one another. You do what you long to do. You look at the things that come into your life as opportunities to grow and serve and show forth Christ's likeness. Then you can say with Paul, when that happens, when you react in a spirit-filled way, that the things that have happened to me have turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. We see it in our attitudes. They're simply saying, Lord, fill me. Control me. He doesn't necessarily change our feelings. We know all of a sudden we don't feel like Superman. But we believe he has changed our ability and in our, in our faith we act. We believe sin's power has been broken. We're no longer slaves to sin. So in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can resist temptation. We don't have to give in to temptation. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's not a feeling. It's a fact. We walk by faith. His power comes to bear in our disappointments, in our hurts, in our frustrations, in our suffering, in our marriage, in our parenting, in our jobs, in our recreation, on our vacations, wherever we are. We walk, and he fills us and empowers us to live a Christ-like, godly life, and we become more like him. The critical question is not how complicated the Spirit's filling is, because it's not complicated. The question is not how am I filled, but, the, but rather how serious am I about living my life for the glory of God, growing in grace, growing in godliness, being filled and seeking first his kingdom and living for his glory studying his word and praying, teach me your word, lead me in your truth, willing to confess sin, willing to be conformed to the image of Christ and obey his words. Jesus said in John 17, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. Remember at the marriage at Cana, Jesus performed his first miracle, the we turned the water into wine, and they ran out of wine, as we know, and Mary went to Jesus and said, they're out of wine. And basically, Mary went back and told the uh, servants, whatever he says to you, do it. And they put the water in the, the wine vessels, and when the steward came, it had turned into wine, the best wine. Why? Because they did what Jesus told them to do. They obeyed God's word. How do we do that? Walk in the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Obey his word. Whatever he says to you, do it. In the life that he's called you to live, he will give you the power to live. For this purpose I also strive, labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Are you serious about obedience? Are you saying to yourself, this has no bearing on my life whatsoever. I don't even think like this. This seems totally irrelevant. Then you need to examine your life to see if you are in the faith. The verse 16 reminds us, of a very important reality, that we have an enemy. It's not suffering, it's not persecution, it's not our circumstances, it's not outside of ourselves, it is in us, it's called our flesh. If we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The conflict 
that comes for the believer between the desires of the flesh and the desires of the Spirit is a real conflict. And we'll look at that aspect next time. So do I delight in God's Word in the inner man? If I do, I will desire to be that kind of person in my actions, and I will ask God's Spirit to fill me and empower me moment by moment, step by step, today. For without Him, I can do nothing. My flesh cannot produce one iota of Christ's likeness. I need Christ's Spirit living within me powerfully to walk as I should walk. And God wants to fill us. He wants us to live. He's given us everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness. And we walk in His Spirit, in His power, to His glory.